All right, so today we're gonna be brewing up a Belgian Pilsner. Now, before you go ahead and click off this video because you think this is gonna be a Stella Artois clone or some other how to brew macro lager video, that's not what this is. This is actually something very special. See, Belgian Pilsner isn't really an official style, but it has enough nuance to it to be separate from the rest of the ubiquitous macro Pilsner that's all over the rest of Europe. So what makes it so special? Let's talk about that. You see, when you think of Belgian beer, you're thinking of like, Trappist ales, Abbey ales, wit beers, Guza, and like very finely crafted sours that have been aging in barrels forever, Saisons, things like that. They're all ales. You never think of Belgian Pilsner, but it still remains actually the most popular beer style in Belgium of them all. Belgian brewing traditions actually kind of leaked into the brewing process for making Belgian Pilsner. Um, and you see things like a little bit more uh, elevated temperatures and yeast expression encouraged from the lager yeast. They're actually typically open fermenting their lagers as well. And then on top of that, you have a little bit harder of water profile going into it and spicier, different non-German hops going in, which is all to say, you're getting a different beer entirely out of this process than what you think of for a standard macro pilsner. And when I say macro pilsner, I'm not just referring to the big guys like Stella Artois. Side note, when you go to Belgium, Stella Artois is not really that common there. What you're gonna find if you go anywhere is Jupiler. It's on tap nearly everywhere in the country. It's your standard macro pilsner there. Honestly, in my opinion, I like Jupiler. It's a nice, crisp Pilsner. It's incredibly refreshing. And sometimes when you're slamming back eight and 10% Abbey Ales all day long, you kind of want something light and refreshing and it hits the spot, that's for sure. It's not just Jupiler though. There's also Bavic Super Pils. That's pretty easy to find. Uh, but also some of the biggest names in fine Belgian beer are making their own Pilsners as well. Places like Duvel Mortgat and even the Brasserie Dupont, the makers of Cezanne Dupont. All this goes to say that Belgian Pilsner is not something to be ignored, and I think it's kind of having its own little moment now. It seems to be kind of growing a little bit in popularity, and for good reason. It's quite a different beer than your average macro lager, as I said before. So let's get into how we're gonna make our own. Of course, the base to any Belgian beer should be good, high quality Belgian base malt. In this case, Belgian Pilsner malt. I'm gonna be using Dingemans. We're gonna go for about a roughly 5% beer. So I'm gonna be using 90%, nine pounds of Dingemans Pilsen malt. And then we're gonna add one pound of flaked corn to this for a little bit of added flavor. It should actually kind of increase the sweetness a little bit and add a nice, delicious little puff corn flavor. I love that in American style lagers and I think it works really well for this particular style as well. For hops in this beer, based on my research, the most typical examples have spicy and herbal hops as opposed to your kind of more floral, classic German hops like Hallertau. So we're looking at things like Sots and Styrian Goldings, for your example. I'm gonna be using all Sots in this beer. Uh, so I'll be using one ounce of it at 60 minutes to bitter for about 16 IBUs, one ounce at 20 minutes for about 10 IBUs, one ounce at 10 minutes for about six IBUs, and then one ounce at zero minutes, giving us a total IBU of about 32. 32 IBUs is definitely a little bit on the low side for a German Pilsner, and definitely on the low side for a Czech Pilsner. So when it comes down to it, using the word Pilsner to describe this might be a little misleading, um, but it does have enough hoppiness in there to balance out the sweetness of the malt and to get that spicy flavor note. Um, and that's what I want out of it. I'm going for a crisp lager, but not one that's necessarily super hoppy and definitely not super bitter. This is actually gonna fall somewhere more along the lines of like a Hellas Export beer uh, than a Pilsner. Now for one of the special ingredients in this beer style, the water profile. Normally when you're making a Pilsner, you want something light and very low in minerals. Very soft water makes excellent Pilsners. The Czech figured that out a long time ago. However, in this case, Belgian Pilsners actually traditionally have a little bit harder of a water profile. They're coming from a place where the water runs a lot harder, and that's one of the reasons why Belgian ales taste the way they do. But in this case, we're gonna be trying to brew a lager with that sort of profile. So it should be interesting to see what happens. So that water profile is 59 parts per million of calcium, seven parts per million of magnesium, 52 parts per million of sodium, 92 parts per million of chloride, 100 parts per million of sulfate, and 63 parts per million of bicarbonate. At the end of the day, that's a balanced water profile, but it does have a lot more minerals in it than I would normally be brewing a Pilsner with. To get the water profile, we're starting out with eight gallons of reverse osmosis water, and we're gonna be adding to that two grams of baking soda, three grams of calcium chloride, two grams of canning salt, which is sodium chloride, two grams of Epsom, and four grams of gypsum. 
For the use of the spear, I tried so hard to find White Labs WLP815, which is the Belgian lager, um, and I could not find that anywhere, unfortunately. So, while I could use any good number of substitute yeast to get a similar effect, and I'll talk about that more in the fermentation segment of the video, um, I actually chose to do something different. I looked in my fridge and I found a yeast that I've been meaning to use for a long time but haven't had a good reason to yet, and I am very excited to be using it today. And it is the WLP 808, the Mythical Hammer Claw Hammer Supply Blend. This is a collaboration yeast that Claw Hammer Supply did with White Labs, and it should be really fun to see what it does. From what I can tell, it's a great yeast to use for this kind of beer. It's very versatile and should get the job done just fine. So we're gonna be using that particular yeast for today. And lastly, for the mash in this beer, I'm gonna be doing a Hook Kurtz style step mash. I have the day off from work today and my uh, daughter's being taken care of, so I actually don't need to do the typical overnight mash that I would be doing uh, otherwise. So I have the whole day to brew and we're gonna go ahead and make use of it. So today we're gonna be doing a 30 minute rest at 148 degrees, stepping up to a 30 minute rest at 158 degrees, and then a 15 minute mash out. This particular step mash schedule has worked really well for me in the past. Pretty much every single time I brew a German log and even modifying it a little bit to brew Belgian ales. This particular mash schedule is actually very efficient uh, for me and it has produced a very good beer every single time I've used it, so there's no reason to change it now. I'm really excited to get this beer going, so let's get it fired up. I started out by adding eight gallons of reverse osmosis water into my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and started to heat that up to the mash temperature target of 148 Fahrenheit for that first step. As I was doing this, I milled out my grain minus the flaked corn, and I also started measuring out my water salts and adding them to the strike water as it was heating up. Normally, because this is a Pilsner and you're using RO water as a base, I would recommend adding some lactic acid or something into the strike water to help pre-acidify it before you mash in with your uh, entirely pale grist here, uh, just to keep that mash pH under control. But lately I've been noticing that my RO water is running rather acidic, so I decided not to do it for once and see what happens to the pH. Once I reached the target first step temperature of 148, I mashed it with the entire grain bill, uh, to include the flake corn as well, and then started up thoroughly, let it recirculate for about 10 minutes, and then took a pH sample and confirmed my suspicions that with zero additions of acid, I was able to reach a perfect target pH of 5.4. So I did nothing, I let it continue through the step mash cycle. So 30 minutes in, I stepped up to 158 Fahrenheit, held that for 30 minutes, and then finished off with a 15 minute rest at 170 Fahrenheit for a mash out, before pulling out the grain basket and letting that drain for about 15 minutes and raising up to a full boil. Once I reached the boil, I added my first bittering addition, which was two ounces of sots at 60 minutes. I waited for another 40 minutes before adding one ounce of sots at 20 minutes, and then 10 minutes later, adding one more ounce of sots, as well as a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. At the zero minute mark, 10 minutes later, I ended the boil and added one more ounce of sots. I started a quick whirlpool to coagulate all the hop material into the center of the kettle, which took about 15 minutes, and then I transferred everything through my counterflow chiller and chilled in one pass into my Brewbilt X2. I used the cooling jacket to bring the temperature down further to my target pitch temperature and initial primary fermentation temperature of 60 degrees. Once the wort temperature was down where I wanted it to be, I pitched in my starter of WLP 808, and I took a gravity measurement, found it to be 1046, which was exactly my predicted original gravity, which was perfect to see, and then I actually left it open to ferment. Uh, so what I did here was just put a piece of tin foil over the top of the airlock port and allowed it to just naturally open ferment for the first few days. More details on this in the fermentation section that follows. So for the fermentation on this beer, as I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna be using White Labs WLP 808, the mythical hammer lager yeast blend. Um, and I'm gonna be fermenting this one actually at a higher temperature uh, of about 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. It's one of those pieces of the Belgian ale brewing process that bled over into the Belgian lager brewing process in that you're pushing the yeast and fermenting it at the higher end of its fermentation temperature spectrum to eke out a little bit more yeast character and flavor from it. And that's what we're gonna be doing here. Uh, it should be interesting to see the effects of that. Um, and hopefully I don't overdo it because it can certainly be distasteful if it uh, is a little bit overdone, but it should be overall interesting. So basically, if you wanna stay true to style 
What I would recommend doing for whatever lager yeast you choose to use with this beer, I would recommend fermenting it at that higher end of the spectrum. In the low 60s is comfortable probably for most yeasts, unless you're using something like Saf Lager W3470, in which case it can go up to like 68 to 70 degrees. Of course, if you're not gonna be using Mythical Hammer for your lager yeast, I would recommend using, if you can find it, White Labs WLP815 Belgian Lager Yeast. Of course, if you can't find that though, a good substitute that's much more readily available is WLP850, a Copenhagen Lager. Uh, this is the Heineken strain, which is very geographically close and similarly brewed uh, to a Belgian Pilsner. So I would recommend checking that out if you can. Otherwise, any standard lager yeast will do, provided that it's going to attenuate well. I would actually not recommend using a very malt heavy strain, something like Y yeast 2206 or 2308. I'd also recommend staying away from Czech lager strains because those are going to push a lot of diacetyl. They're not going to attenuate very far. Um, and it, all of that kind of together with the higher fermentation temperature may not produce the beer that we're trying to get out of it here. If you're looking for dry yeast recommendations, um, I would actually go with Fermentus S189, S23, or W3470. Lalaman Nova Lager would be a good option here as well because you can ferment that very easily at a higher temperature. If you want to take a cool creative spin on this beer, you could brew it like a Kolsch and use a German ale strain. Uh, to get you that kind of floral fruitiness. It's gonna be a little bit different of a yeast expression than if you used a regular lager yeast, but it will get the job done and you will get a nice kind of expression from the yeast by fermenting it at a higher temperature, um, which you could kind of pass off, I think, as a Belgian Pilsner. Of course, this is also a great candidate for pressure fermentation with any other lager, but you're not gonna get as much uh, yeast character out of that. In fact, you might encourage more sulfur character by doing that, so just be careful if that's the route you wanna take. Um, it would be good for Kvike as well if you wanna use something like Lutra or Hornendal, something clean with a little bit of expression um, could be a lot of fun. Otherwise though, the basis of it is if you want to do this in the Belgian Pilsner style, you ferment it at the higher end of the lager yeast temperature range and then try not to ferment it under pressure. Try actually to open ferment it if you can, because that's gonna give you a very different character with a little bit more of that encouragement of the expression of the esters, and it could be really fun. Um, if you're doing so, just be sure to be very careful about your sanitation uh, and ensure that you're not leaving that thing open the entire time it's fermenting. Once that Krausen starts to fall, then you're gonna wanna close it and protect it from oxidation. I'm gonna be doing a semi-open fermentation. So what that means basically is I'm just gonna put tin foil over the airlock port instead of an airlock and then of course you know a couple days into the fermentation once that Krausen starts to go down then go ahead put a regular airlock on there and let the residual co2 do its thing of course with open fermentation you're going to get most of that flavor characteristic in the first few days as fermentation starts to take off and once the primary phase is finished after that first few days then it's time to stop the open fermentation close it up and finish off the fermentation in a sanitary and oxygen free state but just to recap, what I'll be doing is fermenting this one uh, with White Labs WLP 808 Mythical Hammer. And I'll be fermenting this one at about 60 degrees and then gradually ramping it up to about 65 degrees by the time the fermentation is finished with a semi-open fermentation at the very beginning, transitioning to a closed fermentation. Once that fermentation is complete, I'll add some head pressure and cold crash and we'll drop the yeast and then we'll transfer into a keg for some long-term lagering. I'm gonna try and get this thing nice and crispy and ready for when spring starts to heat up and a good refreshing Pilsner is just gonna hit that spot. When the weather gets nice and warm, it's gonna be perfect. And I'll see you guys when that's all ready. So until then, cheers. Fermentation for the beer overall took only about a little over a week to hit the final gravity, which was confirmed a few days later. Uh, for the open segment of the fermentation, I left it open for the first three days, and then once I saw that the fermentation was kind of winding down, that the Krausen was dropping, I added a spunding valve to stop the open fermentation and to start collecting CO2 produced by the rest of the fermentation. Uh, this would both protect the beer from oxidation later on down the road and also uh, build up a little bit of head pressure in the fermenter to assist with cold crashing. Once that fermentation was complete, I cold crashed and the headspace in the fermenter which was filled with CO2 prevented any oxygen suck back from that process. What the cold crash did was drop out a lot of the yeast and sediment in the fermenter and then I was able to uh, dump out the cone as well afterwards making it a little easier to get clear beer into the keg. Once the beer had been transferred into the keg, I started a long-term lagering process, like lagering it in the keg for about two months actually, which was just the perfect amount of time to make it to the beginning of summer where this beer is absolutely perfect on tap.
So the beer is called More Than Semantics, and it comes in at 5.1% ABV and 30 IBUs. I thought it'd be really fun to come out to the beach to taste this one because it's a fantastic beach beer. And you know, I've never actually taken you guys out here. It's a really nice spot and I think honestly it's worth tasting the beer out where the scenery is quite nice. For the appearance of the beer, it is pouring a beautiful 100% crystal clear, uh, light pale color. It is not quite the light straw color that you get out of something like an American light lager, but a shade darker than that. Uh, still quite a lot of color in this beer, but still quite beautiful to look at with that clarity. You can see the bubbles rising through it beautifully, and the head that builds up on it is actually really quite good. Uh, sticks around for a long time, leaves a lot of lacing, and there is a good layer on the surface for the entire drinking session, uh, which is really nice to see. I think it's also worth noting that I used zero findings in this beer. Uh, the clarity here is just a result of time and the little whirl flock that I put in the boil. All right, so let's go in for aroma. I get like a nice sweet crackery malt aroma. I get a really, really nice little honey note off of that. A Little bit of biscuit as well, it's awesome. There's a really nice sweetness that comes out of this aroma too. It just, it smells exactly like you'd expect a well lagered Pilsner to smell like. Now this beer smells absolutely fantastic, but let's go in for the mouthfeel right now because uh, part of a good solid lager is having a perfect mouthfeel. That's everything I want it to be. It's light, it's crisp, it's refreshing. This thing has been lagering since the end of March. It started lagering around the same time that my previously published Munich Dunkel started lagering at, um, but it's actually been sitting cold even longer. And so I just waited until the weather was perfect like this to be able to bring it out because it is the perfect beer for it. That mouthfeel is so crisp. It's got that perfect lager simplicity to it, but it's also so refreshing and so tasty. Sometimes you can really tell when a lager's been sitting for a really long time, and, uh, and this is absolutely no exception. This is just something that gets better and better and better as it goes and sits longer. But now the most important part, let's go in for flavor. <sighs> this is like one of my favorite lagers I've ever made. It's <laughs> so freaking good. It's got that perfect Pilsner character to it. The Pilsner malt shines. It is honey-like. It's got a little bit of bready biscuitiness to it, but really it's just a satisfying, semi-sweet, but still dry, refreshing quality. And then you've got that snappy, assertive Pilsner bitterness to this. The sots in this is really coming through as this nice, spicy, herbal, floral character. A little bit of a lemon tinge on it as well. It's got that perfect level of carbonation too. It's just enough liveliness to it to really make it so refreshing and, and just hit the spot right now. Another thing that's really cool about this one is the, um, the little bit of slight, I think might be yeast derived flavor. I don't know, I'm getting a little bit of extra, extra kind of flavor in the background, almost like a little bit of a white grape character that's coming, I think, from that open fermentation that I decided to do. That was really fun, it was really cool. It did not have any negative impacts on the beer whatsoever, and it's something that I am actually thinking I might do a little bit more of. One thing I wanna do a little bit more of this summer is do some more Czech lagers, and those are traditionally open fermented lagers. If you have the ability to do it, why not do it? So this was kind of a test run for that, and man, I am very happy with the way that that turned out. It's a slight like berry character, it's a slight, uh, I guess for lack of a better descriptor, like a, a white wine gooseberry kind of thing, but also like it's a little bit, I think it's a yeast derived flavor, but I'm, I'm not totally sure. It could be part of the sauce uh, character that I get, but either way, it's very refreshing and very delicious. And um, the whole thing works together in a package that's absolutely fantastic. The minerality in the water profile is certainly noticeable. Um, and it's not detracting from the beer quality whatsoever. What it does is it kind of enhances the crispness of the lager. Sometimes with a very soft water profile, that makes the mouth feel very soft as well, and it's hard to get the crisp edge on it. Sometimes it just stays light-bodied and soft. 
This is absolutely crisp and it has that edge. And that's something that I really, really like about this beer. That slight sweetness from the corn, that nice spicy herbal hoppiness from the sides. Um, I like the way that that turned out for me. It's a delicious beer. It's perfectly clear. I love it. Um, <laughs> this is just the absolute perfect beer for this beach, for this moment. Um, and it's something that I'm gonna enjoy having on tap as long as I can get it to last. As far as potential improvements for this beer go, I honestly do not have any. I can't think of a single thing I don't like about this or I would like to improve. There are things that definitely make it not a German Pilsner, the things that definitely make it not a Czech Pilsner. So if you're going for a more stylistically appropriate beer, then you know this isn't necessarily that, but this is an outstanding Belgian Pilsner, certainly a perfect summer lager. Anyway, guys, happy summer. I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something from it, found it interesting, found it useful. If you did, please go ahead, hit that like button, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Comment down below also with your thoughts, your opinions. Let me know what you think of tasting this in a different location. And yeah, maybe that was interesting for you. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this design. You can get this one and plenty of other designs in the merchandise store that I have linked in the description box down below. Plenty of other stuff on that store as well. I also have a Patreon and my patrons are absolutely critical for funding this channel's production quality. So everything you're seeing here, all of the production quality upgrades that I've made over the last several months have been due to the support of Patreon. So thank you so much to the patrons for what you do. If Patreon's not your thing though, I also have channel memberships and there's also the super thanks button. There's very easy ways to help support me. All that goes right back into the channel as usual. I also have an Amazon store where you can find not only the production equipment that I'm talking about here, but also plenty of brewing equipment that's available on Amazon that I vouch for and have used. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer, so check those links out for some more frequent content updates. And last but certainly not least, guys, thank you for watching the whole thing if you're still with us right now. It means a lot to me that you watch the whole thing because I put a lot of work into these things. They take a long time to produce, and it's just something I have to fit into a busy schedule. Thank you very much for being here. So this one goes out to you. And until the next one, cheers. Cheers.